So today, just to let you know, I I get about 10 emails every day. Seven days a week, 365 days a year of people who have been um, through the mill, so to speak. They've done all the things that are available on on the on Dr. Google, you know, they've tried this and that. They've been to so many doctors. Even some of them have been sent to psychiatrists. And, and after many, many, many different tests and treatments, a lot of money, um, they're still sick. They're still unwell. So the title is Sick for Molds and Mycotoxins, Tried Treatments and Still Unwell. Yeah, here's the keys to getting well from exposure to these molds and mycotoxins. After doing this for more than 30 years and publishing over 100 studies um, and seeing almost 17,000 patients with molds and mycotoxin issues, I, I have a good grasp of how to help people. And that's the important thing, to help people. And underneath my name, I always usually put evidence-based, meaning I have to see evidence. The uh, internet is full of opinions and anecdotes. So-and-so took this, they got so much better, buy this, um, et cetera, no. So I decided to change it and say, in God we trust. All others have to show data. Show me the beef. Show me the evidence that this is working and that it, and it's been proven to work, not only by what your website says, but by medical and scientific publications, evidence, et cetera. So let's get going. So... Um, this is my disclaimer, and here's what I do. You've all seen this. Um, what does this really mean? I read a lot of studies that you will read in several months from now if they're accepted, okay? So um, editor-in-chief of three medical journals and co-editor of one medical journal I'm the reviewer of two medical journals. I'm on the editorial board of four others. I read a lot. On top of that, I publish a lot of studies. Uh, my micro lab is currently involved in studies with uh, on mast cell activation syndrome and on autism. Okay, so essentially, and this is very important because most doctors treat symptoms. They don't find the cause and get rid of it. That key to getting well is detect the cause, remove the cause, and repair the damage. Not keep treating symptoms, which is what American medicine is mostly about. And here's some common sense. The wrong diagnosis, the wrong treatment, you're not going to get well. The right diagnosis with the right treatment, you get well. Very simple. So just two basic slides on molds. Indoor mold spores induce persistent, continuous changes in inflammatory and immune response. In other words, a lot of inflammation. Chronic exposure to molds induce chronic inflammation, okay? Spores of toxic fungi contain mycotoxins. Mycotoxins associated with spores are likely to be absorbed by the respiratory epithelium, meaning your, your, your sinuses and your lungs and translocated to other sites. This goes back to the 1980s, folks. So, okay, so here we go. What does inflammation from these molds and mold spores cause? All these problems. Very simple. And size is important. 
Hair is about, human hair is about 100 microns thick. Spores are two to four microns. Mycotoxins are 0 0.1, the same size as a, a COVID virus, okay? Have you ever heard of urine testing for COVID? Never. Well, but there's urine testing for mycotoxins. Go figure. Exposure to mycotoxins is mainly by inhalation, dermal absorption through the skin. It's not through what you eat. We'll take care of that. And what is the most precise and accurate test for mycotoxins? Okay, my microlab, both IgG, which is immunoglobulin G, this denotes a toxic reaction, and IgE, a mast cell activation measurement of 12 different mycotoxins. This is the way to be able to tell if it's current or past or both current or and, and sometime added to it is sometime in the past. It's available internationally. Now, this is an announcement. I'm letting you know that there will be two new mycotoxins added to the current 12. And it's fumonasin B and zeralinone. And that's a ZA. Sorry about that. And important, retest after six months of treatment. Not six months from the time of testing, but six months from the start of treatment. So here's the urine test. What they're saying about this in this study published a year and four months ago is that demands urine sampling at different time points during the day. Because various factors such as gender, whether you're male or female, how old you are, what is your diet, and how much muscle mass you have can influence creatinine secretion. The same study published in Toxins in October of 2022 says the blood serum test that my microlab uses, which is the ELISA method, comes with significant accuracy, precision, and specificity. And here is a screenshot from last year. I'll get one from this year for the next one. The use of unvalidated urine mycotoxin tests. Okay. So low levels of mycotoxins are found in many foods. Therefore, mycotoxins are found in the urine of healthy people. Please, folks. This slides are taken from the Las Vegas A4M conference two months ago, December 14 to 16, exactly two months ago. And Dr. Rajdani presented understanding immunology lab tests and their capabilities. So he took this, this is a publication, stools from a healthy person that was screened for different bacteria and parasites. Then they were spiked with 14 bacterial bacteria and two parasites, was sent to two different labs. One lab got a 100% light, the other lab 26%, meaning 74% of the time it's wrong. Folks, please pay attention to these things. Because, don't order a lab test because the website makes it interesting. Okay, this study, if you look at the very top, it was published four years ago, and I still see people getting this GI map. Please don't waste your money on that. Now here's the use and limitations of organic acid tests for gut health. Okay, here's, this is a publication. Several popular organic acid tests claim to detect imbalances in gut bacteria and fungi, molds. But most of the microbial markers of these tests do not measure what they claim to do. Don't use this organic acid test. It's worthless. And remember, Look for body burden of chemicals, not chemicals coming out of my urine, such as mycotoxins in urine. 
look for mycotoxin antibodies. And these are all Dr. Vrishdani's slides. Now, this is a slide <clears throat> from a study done by German, all the specialists in Lyme from Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, countries that are noted for their precision. And here it is, folks. Unsuitable diagnostic test for Lyme. PCR. Yet people are ordering Igenix. They're ordering a Vibrant for this. Forget it. It's not a suitable test. Here's another one. The VCS test, which is ridiculous. That's, I'm not even going to spend, waste time talking about how stupid that test is. It's totally ridiculous. It's unproven. Then here's the CD57. It's really, all these tests are not valid tests for Lyme. Okay, so let's talk about the five steps to healing for molds and mycotoxins. Step number one, apply the first rule of toxicology. Get the patient away from the toxin or the toxin away from the patient. I talk to people all the time on Zoom who tell me, yes, we had a guy come in and he didn't find anything, uh, et cetera. All these things, excuse me, folks. It's an unregulated industry, first, un unfortunately. Second, as the EPA has said, 50% of the time, you don't find it. 50 percent of the time half the time you can't find it okay it's in between walls it's inside the air conditioning and ducts and throughout the house it's underneath tiles etc but this is the first rule and if this is not done the patient will pers be persistently have high levels of mycotoxins and feel bad. Yes, and they'll, they'll say, oh, but I had my home tested and they told I spent so much money and it was fine. Well, I'm so sorry. This is not, if it were fine, you'd get better, period. So this is the ERMI test that people still order. Look at the date on this, August 22nd, 2013. Okay, 11 years ago. You're not supposed to be using the ERMI test. And if you think there's a test for mycotoxins in, on dust, I have a bridge I can sell you in Brooklyn. This is a test that's very interesting. I like it because it's inexpensive, and it's the first step to say, is there something here or not? And it helps guide you. It's like the initial uh, beginning of checking your indoor environment. Okay. And by the way, like I would tell you, I don't, I don't get any money from them or anything. But this gotmold.com caught my attention a few years ago, and it really is helpful as an initial evaluation. Again, initial. Of the five steps, step number two, give an antifungal Spornox. The generic is itraconazole. Remember folks that all generics are made in India or China. So they may not always be as pure as we would like it to be, and you may have some side effects. So although I recommend they take the generic in the beginning, if there's about a 5% chance that a person may get kind of like a gastritis, um, irritation of the gastrointestinal tract, not feel so good, then you switch to, to the actual um, uh the actual um, antifungal brand name Spornox. So, artriconazole, also known as Spornox, this is from a publication published seven years ago, okay? 
It's a common antifungal that was developed 1980s. It's been in clinical use for 35 years. That was in, as according to 2017. So add seven more years, now 42 years. When established safety record. What's another study? Is there another one? Yes, here's a more recent one. Okay, itraconazole. Okay, Re read. Itraconazole has been well tolerated with doses up to 400 milligrams per day being general, fr generally free of side of serious side adverse effects. So it's okay to use. Yes, if you go to Dr. Google, your eyeballs are going to fall out. Your teeth are going to fall out. Your hair is going to fall out. Your heart, you're going to have a heart attack. Your liver is going to fry and all these things. This is the medical evidence. This is the show me the data. And here's another one published in microorganisms three years ago. Voriconazole in patients with acute on chronic liver failure and continuous renal replacement therapy. Okay, folks, don't believe what you read on the, remember what Abraham Lincoln once said, don't believe everything you read on the internet. Go to the medical published studies. And here's another thing about itraconazole and fluconazole. I see this all the time. Remember, there's two types of molds or fungi, single cell and multiple cell. Single cell are all the yeasts that are used to, to for bread, for making uh, alcohol and beer and so on and so forth. And candida is one example. Yes. So diflucan or fluconazole works for that. It does has no effect on multicellular molds such as aspergillus, stachybotrys, penicillium, etc. But itraconazole not only gets rid of the multicellular molds, aspergillus, stachybotrum, penicillium, etc., but it also gets rid of the single cell like candida. Step number three. Take the right eight supplements at the right dosage. So we've had number one, which is the first rule of toxicology, get the patient away from the toxin or the toxin away from the patient. Step number two, take an antifungal such as Spornox, and now we're gonna go three, through eight supplements. Here we go, phosphatidylserine, why? Because molds affect the brain, brain fog, short-term memory loss, sleep disturbance, anxiety, depression, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, this is what I recommend because it's worked now for thirty plus years, almost seventeen thousand patients, and this is from a study. It enriches myelin. Mycotoxins cause demyelination. That's been well established in medicine. Influences the met metabolism of neurotransmitters, acetylcholine, norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine. It stimulates enhanced performance on tasks that test learning ability and short-term memory. What else? Compared with the effects of placebo, which was ineffective, obviously, phosphatidylserine supplementation produced significant improvements in short-term memory recall, immediate memory, vocabulary skills, and ability to recall words, attention, and vigilance. Folks, what more do you want? Okay. So... Um, does octoconazole affect liver? Yes, if you read the internet, did you just not see what I wrote, what I what are in published studies? Y your doctor is concerned because he doesn't know. Okay? And I've treated up to 98 years old. No problem. Okay? So 
Don't rely on what somebody's worry is. Rely on what is published and scientific medical data. Recent studies confirm, this is for number two, the second one, melatonin. Recent studies, and here's the, at the bottom is the study. If you want to go and read it or give it to your doctor who says, no, that doesn't work, or no, oh, you're not going to, it's whatever. All the negative things. Recent studies confirm the benefits of melatonin in reducing the cellular damage generated as a result of metabolism of toxic agents. These protective effects are apparent when melatonin is given as a soul therapy or in conjunction with other potentially protective agents. So folks, pay attention to these things. These are published studies. Not my doctor says this, okay? Everyone has an opinion. But this is published medical and scientific evidence. It's data. Melatonin's ability to protect neurons, brain cells, from molecular damage due to a wide variety of substances, including mycotoxins. Ask your doctor, did, you, did he know that? I bet he didn't. He had no clue. The third, B-complex. And Oh, please. Don't let's not get into this methylation stuff. Oh, but I tested for this and I can't take it. Okay, excuse me. Read what it says in these studies. Okay, this is a study that looked at B vitamins and the brain mechanism, dose, and efficacy. A review it was published in the journal Nutrients. The B vitamins compromise a group of eight water-soluble vitamins. <clears throat> Their collective effect are particularly prevalent to numerous aspects of brain function, including energy production, DNA, RNA, synthesis and repair, genomic and non-genomic methylation and the synthesis of numerous neurochemicals and signaling molecules. Furthermore, evidence from human research clearly shows both that a significant proportion of the population of developed countries, such as this one, suffer from deficiencies or insufficiencies in one or more of this group of vitamins. And that, in the absence of an optimal diet, administration of the entire B vitamin group, rather than a small subset, at doses greatly in excess of the current governmental recommendations would be a rational approach for preserving brain health. Got that? Number four, magnesium, the 11th most common element in the human body. This is a master mineral, and it's a necessary ingredient for approximately 350 enzyme systems, thus playing a role in the majority of the body's metabolic processes. Up to 80% of the population are deficient in this nutrient. And magnesium binding sites have been detected on 3,700 plus human proteins that are essential for building, repairing, and maintaining your body's cells. 95% of magnesium is in the, of, in the cell is in the mitochondria. So all these talks about um, magnesium, uh, um, uh, uh, no, I mean, you know, mitochondrial dysfunction and treat like that, no. Here's the root of it. 
Magnesium is a cofactor for a substance known as ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which plays a role in the energy metabolism of every cell. The processes by which the body breaks down proteins, carbohydrates, and fats and converts them into energy. ATP is the energy currency of the cell made in the energy factories of the cell, which are the mitochondria. Magnesium is required for vitamin C as a cofactor. Okay? So it activates one of the body's most important antioxidant nutrients for support of the immune system. Magnesium is also a cofactor for many other nutrients, including zinc, potassium, vitamin B complex, calcium, and vitamin D. Without magnesium, it would be difficult to absorb and use these necessary substances. Here is the study. Magnesium in prevention and therapy nutrients. So if your doctor says something, say, where did you get your information from? So folks. And here's magnesium deficiency. The causes on the left in red, stress, depleted food resources, less magnesium rich foods. Burns, kidney disease, alcohol, caffeine, antacids, antibiotics, chemotherapy, malabsorption, irritable bowel syndrome, celiac, diabetes, diarrhea. One of the symptoms on the right in blue, migraine, low depression, low mood, depression, anxiety, irritability, insomnia, seizures, cardiac arrhythmias, high blood pressure cardiovascular disease risk, muscle spasm, menstrual cramps, lethargy and fatigue, numbness, numbness or tingling. In bone, osteoporosis, osteomalacia, constipation, and type 2 diabetes mellitus. So you see why it's important. Number five. Vitamin D3, vitamin D supplementation can be very helpful in cognitive impairment, vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, and other conditions that develop due to brain cell malfunction or cell death. Low vitamin D levels are associated with increased cognitive impairment and cognitive decline, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, cancer, and respiratory diseases. This is something I published 11 years ago in a medical journal. This is medical data, medical evidence. Okay, folks? So just to kind of keep you in the loop, I have over 100 studies, by the way. Omega, Q plus max. What does it contain? DHEA and EPA from squid, not from fish livers. And we'll get into fish later on in a short time. L-carnitine, vital for the heart health. Curcumin, a great inflammatory. Coenzyme Q10, great for cardiovascular disease. And resveratrol, which is a great antioxidant and anti-inflammatory that comes from the skin of red grapes. Seven, probiotics, spore-forming bacilli. So, Reading University, Dr. Simon Cutting, with the Food Safety Authority, which is basically the FDA of England, showed that less than 10% of the usual probiotics you buy from all the shops around and off the internet, which are lactobacilli and bifidobacterium, less than 10% get to the colon. In other words, 90% don't. Then 
The University of California, Davis, examined 16 probiotic products from local stores to check if the strains claimed on the label matched those that were found inside the bottle. They only, find, they only found one in 16 that actually matched the label claim. In some products, there was pill-to-pill -pill variation in the same bottle. Folks, that's ridiculous. And there are no studies, not any, that have shown that 200 billion CFUs, colony-forming units, is more effective than 10 billion colony forming units. And that 15 strains are more effective than five strains. That's all marketing, not medical and science, scientific evidence. Oops, let me go back. Effective treatment for small intestine bacterial overgrowth, SIBO, okay? That's what probiotics from spore forming bacilli do. It increases the circulating T cells and B lymphocytes by pumping, by becoming active in the small intestines and stimulating Peyer's patch, which is part of the immune system in the gut. Shifts the body from Th2 inflammatory to Th1 adaptive. Okay, that's mainly immunology, improve pattern recognition to curb autoimmune and allergic immune response via the toll-like toll -like receptors and Peyer's patches, and reduce the incidence of irritable bowel syndrome, okay? Number eight, we're getting to the end of that. Our bodies neither can make nor store vitamin C. So we must obtain it from an external source. Almost all fruits and vegetables contain some quantity of vitamin C, but you'd have to eat like a lot of it, not one or two oranges, but a dozen, okay? Vitamin C helps in depression, especially in children. It reduces uric acid levels, and it reduces the risk for brain cancer, gliomas, and it lowers your lipids. Okay, folks, that's very important. Um, and by the way, the HLA-DR gene, that is a myth. There is a single study that shows there's any evidence that that gene does, has anything to do with molds and mycotoxins. And I've shown this in all my previous, in many of my previous webinars, that HLA DR stuff is pure sham. Okay, so now, supplements. I've shown you the eight supplements that you need. Now, let me talk about supplements. A recent study found that 11% of nearly 60 tested dietary supplements actually contain an accurate amount of the key ingredients that are listed on the label. 40%, remember 11 did, 40 did not contain a detectable amount of the ingredients at all, 40%. So those of you who are taking 20, 30, 25, 40 supplements, you're taking, you may be taking nothing. And here's another thing about supplements. Glutathione increases toxicity to the mycotoxin cause called gliotoxins. Gliotoxin affects the brain. It is one of the causes of multiple sclerosis and other brain issues. If you have positive antibodies to gliotoxins, do not take glutathione supplement in any form. So what is, I went through step number one, 
which was get the patient away from the toxin or the toxin away from the patient. I did step number two. Step number two was to take spornots, antifungal. Step number three, the eight important supplements you need to take. Step number four is nutrition. We're going to go through foods banned in all other countries, but not here. Artificial food dyes, cereals, baked goods, candy, sports drinks. Look at the sport drinks. Blue, red, green, yellow, please. Sodas, macaroni and cheese, and more. Why it's bad? Because dyes might make your food look pretty, but they're made from chemicals derived from petroleum that's also used to make gasoline, diesel fuel, and tar. Okay, it's not good for you. And look at these. You recognize that, don't you? Farmed salmon. Well, why it's bad? Because if you're doubling up on your salmon intake because of all the amazing health benefits from those omega-3 fatty acids, well, you're actually making a big mistake because you need to consider if you're buying wild crops or farm-raised. Like if you get salmon from Alaska, great. But farm salmon are raised on an unnatural diet of grains, antibiotics, and other drugs. And their flesh is great. And then they make it look pink by adding astaxanthin, which is made from petrochemicals. So don't eat farmed salmon. Bromonated vegetable, where it's found in sports drinks and citrus flavored sodas. And why it's bad. The main ingredient is a poisonous chemical that is toxic and corrosive to the body. And it's been linked to organ system damage, birth defects, schizophrenia, and more. So, Olestra, <laughs> where it's found, fat-free potato chips and french fries. Why it's bad? Lower calorie counts aren't always worth it when the product is made with cooking oil substitute Olestra which inhibits, prevents your body's ability to absorb vitamins. Got that, folks? Azo dicarbonamide, where it's found frozen dinners, boxed pasta, packaged baked goods, and various breads. Why it's bad? This chemical, which helps bleach flour quickly, is also used in foamed plastics, okay? You don't want any of these chemicals in your body. How about synthetic hormones, RBGH and RBST? Where it's found? Milk and dairy products. Why is it bad? Okay, it's first of all, it's a synthetic hormone. It's not a real hormone. It's a chemically made hormone. But they're still legal here in the States. Cows treated with them can become infertile and develop inflamed udders. So if we think humans are immune to that effect, we're wrong. The hormones have been linked to breast, colon, and prostate cancer. So it's not good for you, definitely. What about BHA and BHT? Okay. Bisphenol A and B, BHB and BPA and all these. Where it's found? Cereal, gum, butter, meat, mixed nuts. Why it's bad? They help keep food from becoming rancid, which is good in theory. But these chemicals have been proven to cause cancer in rats, and the risk of causing cancer in humans is, humans is not worth the risk. You don't want any risk for cancer. 
arsenic. Where it's found, chicken. Okay, it's it's given to chicken to eat. It's in the chicken feed, and it promotes growth, boosts pigmentation, which makes the chicken flesh look more pink, and and maybe you think it's got more healthy, but it isn't. Arsenic is classified as a human carcinogen by the EPA. So eat organic. Potassium bromate, where it's found? Wraps, rolls, flatbread, bagel chips, breadcrumbs. Well, that's bad. It's made with the same harmful chemical as brominated vegetable we looked at, and brominated flour helps with decreasing baking time and cost. But is the convenience worth the risk of kidney damage, cancer, and nervous system damage? No, of course not. Ractopamine. It's a feed additive for pigs and beef. It is used by livestock producers to increase the conversion of fat into meat. So when you go to the store and you pick up bacon, there's less white and more red. It adds lean muscle to animals prepared for market. The ractopamine is associated with major health problems in food producing animals. But why it's bad, it's been linked to heart problems and even poisoning in humans. It's highest in ham, salami, bacon, and pork. You understand why nutrition is so important. Now we're going to the fish, which I had mentioned to you before about why omega-3s from squid is much better. Look at the amount of mercury found in these seven fish. Okay? Huge amounts of mercury. And mercury goes to the brain. You don't want mercury. Swordfish, king mackerel, big eye tuna, marlin, canned tuna, cod, American lobster, all these. What else to avoid? Avoid at all costs anything that contains artificial flavoring, artificial colorings, artificial preservatives, artificial sweeteners, soy in any form. I know that they're popular in Chinese restaurants, etc. Don't use it. Do not eat canned food. Why? Because the lining of canned foods contains bisphenol A, BPA. And don't microwave anything that's contained in a plastic container, please. You picking up on all these things, I hope. What are, the what are the foods to avoid? Breads, they're packaged in a plastic bag and breakfast cereals. Cake, ice cream, other sweets, frozen or packaged meals, soft drinks and fruit drinks, pizza, salty snacks, packaged baked goods, chicken nuggets, fish nuggets, bottle dressing and sauces. Just read the labels. How about, is there any microtoxins in food? Yes, in countries, predominantly in countries with lacking implementation of adequate food safety policies, mainly in certain countries in Africa and the eastern parts of China. And that's it not in industrial countries. The respiratory system is the first point of contact during inhalation of mold spores and mycotoxins, not the gut. Even a connection between mycotoxins and Parkinson's disease has been observed. This was published in this study in the International Journal of Molecular Science in 2021. 
the amount of mycotoxins tested in foods have been shown in many studies to be below what is called the tolerable daily intake, TDI. And that's set by the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, the European Food Safety Authority, the FSA, and the UN Food and Agricultural Organization and the World Health Organization Joint Expert Committee on Food Additives. So you're not getting it from food. Oh, I read on the internet that, okay, please folks, please. What you read on the internet is, is very opinion oriented and is anecdotes, stories, etc. We need data, medical and scientific data, medical and scientific evidence. And here it is, I'm giving it to you. Here's an exposure. I look at the last three lines, please. An adult weighing 170 pounds would have to consume, and look at the underline, 14 pounds of oatmeal or 20 slices of bread to be affected by microtoxins, okay? No one's going to do that. Oh, and the binders. Oh, my gosh. Binders are all basically sham. And here's a study. Binders rely on the absorption of mycotoxins from the gut, preventing it from getting into the bloodstream. Well, unfortunately, mycotoxins are detoxified by gut microbiota. <clears throat> and... Dr. Leonard Weinstock, professor of gastrointestinal GI medicine at Washington University School of Medicine, and I wrote an article about that that I'm, I'm, I'd be glad to send you. It's coming up in a couple more slides. So what, what binders are we talking about? Kaolinite, clays, activated charcoal, zeolite, bentonite, Aluminosilicase, they neutralize aflatoxin. Unfortunately, aflatoxin is not found in indoor air. They are ineffective in all other mycotoxins. In addition, they bind vital vitamins as well as macro and micro elements. And that's regardless of how, at what time you take them away from meals, etc. Okay? It's been said that carbohydrates like beans feed candida. Okay, that's another opinion on the internet. There's no studies that show this is real or true. It's just talk on the internet. So, here's a patient comment. I've watched all your videos, and I very much want to use your treatment paradigm. I was formerly seeing a functional medicine doctor who was trained by Neil Nathan, but I've not made progress on his protocol for the last three years. I have limited funds, so I cannot afford to start treatment with a new functional medicine doctor. Well, folks, the treatment that I outlined for you takes six months, and you're well. Six months of that treatment, not three years, not two years, not four years, six months. And this has been published. It's not my opinion. So here's Dr. Weinstock. And we wrote on the first line, the mycotoxins, the brain, the gut, and misconceptions, which is like the question I just tried to answer. And here's a second one. Molds, mycotoxins, they're affecting children. And then here's another one, Lyme disease and mycotoxicosis. How to differentiate between the two. And lastly, environmental triggers and autoimmunity in autoimmune diseases with Dr. Vishdani and Dr. Pollard. Dr. Pollard is professor of medicine at UCLA. So the next tea time is March 6th. 
You can ask me about anything in medicine, heavy metals, implants, breast implants, silicone implants, Lyme disease, moles, mycotoxins, and a very popular test, mycoplasma. I had a person ask me today, no, I'm sorry, this was yesterday, that their son was getting, uh, had a positive mycoplasma test. I asked him two questions. Does he have a chronic cough? No. Does he have fever? No. So that doctor is treating a test result. He's not treating a patient. Remember that. So the next tea time, March 6th, next webinar, March 13th. These are all at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Come and join us, folks. And if you want any of these studies, please, at the top is my um, address on the on the. Uh, um, that you can send your questions to immune doctor at gmail.com. Okay. That's my email. Ask me for these or any others. I'll be happy to send them to you. You don't have to go to PubMed and pay the money to pay to get them. So is there something else I can help with? Essence is if you have any questions, tea time is the best time to ask them. And folks, happy St. Valentine's Day to all of you. And I'll see you in about three weeks on March 6th for tea time, where you can ask me about anything. And, and shortly later, a week later, I'll give my next webinar. I hope you see that it's easy to treat this. It doesn't take years. It doesn't take binders. It doesn't take all kinds of, I don't know what, not nonsense. This is proven. It's in medical book chapters. It's, I've published over a hundred studies in medical journals. This is what you need. So folks, I hope you enjoyed this. Again, happy St. Valentine's Days. Have a great rest of the week. And thank you for coming here and listening to what is medical and scientific evidence.